Amen. Turn to Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, please. Second Corinthians five, I'm gonna look at verses nineteen and twenty-one. Verses 19 through 21. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Let's read. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, and so God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that, that we, we might be made, made the, the righteousness of God in him. him. Amen. Amen. It's already recorded. Thank you. Today we're going to look at this text, and we're dealing with the topic of reconciliation primarily, but we're going to deal with a few different things here. I actually uh, I taught a message on reconciliation over a year ago, and as I reviewed it, I have a, a slightly different view on one aspect of something that I said there that is pretty important. Pretty important. So I'm going to revise that a bit. And um, you'll notice, well, you'll, you'll just notice that I'm pretty much preaching the same thing I've been preaching for the last year. But as it pertains to this topic, you'll see there's a slight revision that is going to be made. And there's some things that you and I need to see as it pertains to what this topic of reconciliation is about so that we can express it correctly to those that we know in the uh, Christian community and, and, and brothers and sisters in our faith. So let's look at this today. Um, verse 19 says, To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Now, I'm going to stop right there because if you look at this particular verse right here, it's letting you know that God the Father was actually in Christ when Jesus Christ did his redemptive work. When Jesus Christ was actually doing all that he had done on our behalf, the Bible says that God was in Christ and he was doing something. And what we're talking about, which is our topic today, Reconciliation. So that he was reconciled. Reconciling the world unto himself. So let's just stop right there and consider something because this is something that we established last time just so that we can get this ball rolling. If God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, is the world reconciled? Yes. Is the world reconciled? Amen. So we agree that the world is reconciled. And I started with this because it's important that you know these represent individuals. The box represents the world. And in a sense, God is saying that he's reconciled the world unto himself. Now, I'm going to ask this question real briefly to see if we're still on the same page. Are these individuals saved? No. Okay, reconciliation is not salvation. Reconciliation talks about how God has changed the status between mankind and himself. See, we were at odds against God. We were contrary to God. We were dead uh, before God, and we, we still are dead, so to speak. But it's important that you know that this reconciliation that has taken place, that is true, the Bible is very clear in saying it, 
has been taken care of. God has reconciled the world unto himself. And I want to bring verse, the, the rest of this uh, passage in because there's some things that we want to um, look at and keep an understanding of. Look what it says. Now he's talking about the world, but look what he's doing as it pertains to the world. Reconciling the world unto himself. Now look what it says. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. You see this world here? God is not imputing these unsaved, unbelieving individuals' trespasses unto them. Do we recognize that? See, this is something that really causes a, uh, someone to have to really study this out because when we understand that God has changed the dynamic of what man's relationship with him is based upon something that he done through his son, Jesus Christ. This is what we need to know because this goes into our full-fledged ministry of ambassadors for Christ. This is the, the this is the caption. This is the the groundwork. This is the basis of what we need to know when we go into a world as ambassadors for Christ. This is the information that God puts right out front that we should walk out with. We should know what the status is. We should know what the situation that we're walking into actually has 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 developed into and these are some of the the, the the dynamics the fundamental principles by which we govern ourselves knowing what God is doing as it pertains to the world what position is the world in what do we need to do to get the world fully reconciled unto God so at this point God has reconciled the world and then he's put them in a status where he's not imputing their trespasses unto them. Do you know what that actually means? You got individuals sitting here that's dead in trespasses and sin, but God is not imputing their trespasses unto them. God is not charging them with sin. So in other words, God is treating everybody in the world uh, today based upon the same standard. So uh, they're getting the benefit of even individuals that are saved. This is why when we look at situations like Katrina and the tsunami, and individuals in religion might say that um, if we humble ourselves, seek God, turn from our wicked ways, then God will turn and God is punishing us because we did this bad thing or that bad thing. And they look at worldly occurrences. 9-11 was because of sinful America. And you're talking about all these different things. Based upon this, is that true? No. You see, because God is not imputing their trespasses unto them, first of all. And secondary, if God was going to pour out any wrath on anyone, who has God poured the wrath out on? The Lord His, Son. Jesus Christ. His Son, Jesus Christ. You have to understand that. So we know the groundwork of this. We know, okay, somebody wants to say that wrath is going to be poured out. No, God already poured His wrath out on Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago. If somebody wants to say, well, God is de- judging them for their sin. Their sin is a problem. No, God is not judging them for their sin because he's not charging their sins unto them. Mm-hmm. You and I as ambassadors have to go in to our work as an ambassador for Christ knowing some things. And when we know it, we are better equipped to begin to work in this office of ambassadorship. Because if we don't know, we're going to get tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And I believe me, it's a lot of things out there that people are saying that is not true. There's terms and semantics that people are, are using in Christendom that don't even apply to what God is doing with you and I as members of, of the body of Christ and our ambassadorship. Yeah. But if we don't understand the sound doctrine as we <coughs> out, we'll fall victim to these things. Turn to Romans, the fifth chapter. So now, sometimes reading ahead, understanding the full doctrine, you can begin to develop some things and see how God has laid this thing out. Look at Romans the 5th chapter verse 10. Romans 5 verse 10. Romans 5 verse 10. Look at this. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. See a little comma there? Mm -hmm. The stop. So we're going to stop at that thought. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Is that illustrated anywhere up here? You see this? So now, this is God reconciling when we were what? 
Enemies. Enemies. There's a form of reconciliation that has taken place that God has done with his enemies. We see this? So we have to understand that, that this is a form of reconciliation that is taking place that is prior to our salvation <coughs> that is already taking place. And you and I need to know it because when we begin to um, try to talk to individuals as it pertains to being ambassadors, we need to know exactly where to place them. Now let's go on with the rest of that verse. It says, for, when, for, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we should what? Be saved by his life. He should be saved by his life. We need to know that his death accomplished something and his life fully accomplishes something. Yes. His death is applied to even those that don't believe. Yes. We recognize this? This is why the gospel talks about that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ died for everybody's sins. There's nobody left out there. Everybody's sin problem has been taken care of. 100 Sin is no longer the issue. Mm -hmm. Now, but I have to express it a different way here. I, I, I believe I said, and in my zealousness I said this, and, and, and I, I just thank God for giving me the ability to be humble enough to admit this. I said at one point, everybody's sin was forgiven. But that's not how we express this. We have to recognize that in this portion, everybody's sins are paid for. And you know why I use the word paid for? Turn to 1 Timothy 2. First Timothy two. Mm. I'm going a little ahead here. That ranch, uh -huh. Amen. First Timothy two. I'm gonna look at the one verse and we'll come back to this verse. We're gonna deal with it. Um, verse six. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Mm -hmm. Now this is why we study to show ourselves approved, but we also have to look at the words and the semantics. The terminology, do, do we understand what ransom is? Ransom means a price paid for the release of someone in captivity. The price has been paid. The price was what? What was it? The death of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ paid for our release from the captivity of sin. Sin. We're no longer held. These individuals, whether they know it or not, they're no longer held captivity to sin. And Jesus Christ is not even charging their sins to them anymore. They're released from sin. sin does, they're free from the captivity that sin brings. And we have to make them know that. And the, the thing I love about this area of scripture, it constantly says we beseech them, we beseech them, we beseech them. Because this is not a message you use, you, you, you verbalize passively. It's a time element to this. Yes, yes, yes. We don't have forever, we don't have eternity to talk about this. There's a time element to this and we want to make that known as well. That's why the urgency is there. Because we know that if we don't let this be known during a particular time, time is going to run out. Sometimes we get complacent in our own lives. We were just talking about a moment ago how we get complacent even in our prayer life. And the thing about being complacent in any aspect of our Christian life, if we're complacent about anything dealing with, you and, with us individually, that will cause us to be more complacent in other areas. You see what happened? Now listen, if I'm having health problems and I don't take care of my health problem, I think prayer could be a, a aid to my health problem, I might not be able to go out and witness somewhere that I might have witnessed to because now I'm at home sick. You see what I'm saying? So everything has a chain reaction. Everything goes along course. So we want to be zealous. That's why that prayer for zealousness is never going to get old about what God is having us to do. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, rather, 5. 
understanding this and we're going to get uh, come back and answer some questions at the end but we want to just slowly walk through this to get the understanding that I believe God would have us to have out of this small area of scripture that is absolutely phenomenal. Do you recognize that nowhere else in scripture does God make the reference to the things that he says here about reconciliation and not imputing their trespasses unto them? And because it's not mentioned as, as frequently, people don't know it. Because you and I are the only ones that have the spiritual understanding to go and tell somebody about. But if we get preoccupied with other things, we won't talk about things that have so much urgency and so much um, importance to them. So we continue to read the verse 19, to wit. To wit means simply, that's old English. It talks about to know. You know, God, he uses the word in Pauline epistles, knowing this. And the reason I say that, because I always talk about the, how our Christian life cannot function on the basis of ignorance. So he's always going to say knowing this, to wit. To wit means to your wit. You're talking about witty. You remember that term, witty? So to put into your knowledge, put into your understanding. This is something that we put, it, it could be also listed as a faithful saying. All of those semantics are pretty much laying out the same thought. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto us. Now look what it says. And committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now look at this. Have you ever considered this? If they're already reconciled to God, what's the ne why is it necessary for us to go forth with the word of reconciliation? Because it hasn't been applied to their account yet. Has this reconciliation not been applied to their account yet? It's applied, but everybody don't have that understanding. They don't understand that that's been taken care of. It's another reconciliation, verse 20. Amen. See, this is it. This reconciliation is done. This aspect of reconciliation. But see, the thing about this reconciliation is that it's temporary. I have to show you something here. This reconciliation has a right. Right. parenthetical time limit to it. You have to get it in your understanding. You have to know what how these things are working. Because if we don't know how it's working, we definitely can't express it to anybody else. There's an aspect of reconciliation that everybody in the world has benefited from today. Because that's what God did when he was in Christ. See, he changed our status before him. He changed our status before him. We were look at uh, let's let's look at uh Let's look at Ephesians first. Look at Ephesians. Don't want to jump ahead here. No, let's not, let's hold. I'll hold that. We'll we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So I might get ahead of myself. I'm gonna try to pace myself through here. Let's turn to go to verse twenty. It's all gonna to come together here. It's all gonna come together. Now, verse 20, 2 Corinthians five. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Who's an ambassador for Christ? What did you do to be an ambassador for Christ? That's all you did. Now, some ambassadors for Christ are more equipped than other ambassadors. You ever recognize that? What, how does an ambassador for Christ get equipped? To do what? Show thyself approved, right? See, this is what we have to do. When you're talking about your ambassadorship, if you take your ambassadorship seriously, you're studying to show yourself approved. And the more you study, the more, you know, the more uh, detail you can be in your work as an ambassador for Christ. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did. Now, this is the part that I'm telling you. When you get into your ambassadorship and what you're doing, and this is primarily one of the major things that you're doing in your life. You're an ambassador for Christ, and that's one of your primary functions as a member of the body of Christ. Everybody is a potential individual that needs full reconciliation unto God. And you're trying to identify that. You're listening to the words they say and the lifestyle that they're living and trying to see how you can in inspire them or try to uh, uh, get into, uh, get into their, uh, their life uh, to a certain extent to understand whether or not they need this reconciliation because that's what God would have you to do. And primarily that should start where? At home. At home. 
See, it's funny. You can't walk past all the people in your house that's not saved and think you're an ambassador outside your house. What kind of sense does that make? The man that provided not for his own house is what? So that God wants you to first and foremost deal with things at home. Let's deal with that. You know, then once we do that, we deal with our surroundings and where we're at. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. And this term keeps popping up. What does beseech mean? It's a, it's a strong imploration. Some people can beg cool. Some people beg raw frantically. But <laughs> begging is begging either way. Yes, sir. Begging is begging. And really, you know, and, and the point that you're really trying to make is that, with that is that you can't be prideful when you're trying to be an ambassador for Christ. Begging is not something that somebody with pride can do. No, great point. You ever seen a beggar have pride? Great point. Hey, buddy. Let me borrow 10 bucks. <laughs> okay. That's the prideful thing, right? What you think you're going to say? <laughs> no thanks. I, I pass. But if I come, and I'm really down on my luck right now. Could you please let me borrow 10? I, I'll give it back to you. You know, you know, maybe you have a little more compassion for it. You see what I'm saying? But that prideful beggar, he definitely does get So when we're begging somebody about this, we're not coming in a way that they can't receive us. We're really trying to come in a manner that they really understand that what you're talking about has some urgency to it. And we let, need to really let them know that this is urgent stuff. God did beseech you by us. Now look what it says here. And, and, and my brother just made a reference to there's another reconciliation here. Because they're already reconciled. But now he's talking about being reconciled. Look what he says. In Christ stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be, look what it says, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So this is the basis of which we our ministry goes into. This is what happened. And we'll see this all continually re-examined or re-expressed, so to speak. This is what happened. For he made him to be sin for us. You see this? For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. This is what took place right here. This took place for all the individuals. They're not even saved yet. But did God make him be sin for them? Yes. These individuals will not go to hell because of a sin problem. Sin is not their problem. Right. Jesus Christ really was made sin for them. Sin won't be the issue with them. Their reconciliation took care of the sin problem once and for all for them. And when we're talking to people to disassociate ourselves with religion... We always want them to know that their sin is not the issue. We're not trying to try to make, make ourselves look big or make ourselves look so holy and righteous right. by saying they need to get themselves together. Why don't you stop doing this? Why don't you? No, in the midst of whatever you are doing, the one thing that we would ask you to and beg you to do is trust that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. In whatever state that you are in. That's our strong imploration. In whatever state an individual is in. So this is the basis in which we are talking about them being reconciled unto God. So this is where the substitution was made. Now we turn to 1 Timothy um, 2nd chapter. Because now it shows you how Jesus Christ is such... And, and when we're using these verses, it shows you how we make segues and connections to what God is doing. First Timothy 2, we just um, read a piece of that, but I wanted to come back to it here. I'm going to start at verse 4 because this is our basis of our ministry. Look what it says. You see how all of this connects. Mm -hmm. Verse 4 says, who will have all men to be what? Saved. That's our that's our thrust as ministers of reconciliation. That's what God would have us to do. And then once a person is saved, come into the knowledge of the truth. Now this is where the substitution has been made for all men. Look what it says in verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 
sometimes we really don't understand how to separate the man Christ Jesus from his divine nature. But you have to recognize that the man Christ Jesus is responsible for the work that goes on here with God the Father being in him. See, the man Christ Jesus took on the form of humanity to change God's status or uh, to change our position before God, Jesus Christ took on the form of this sinful flesh of these individuals here so that these individuals could be reconciled. Mm -hmm. So he's the mediator. Look what it says. Mm -hmm. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Look at the beauty of this. God did all of this by himself. Mm -hmm. He didn't utilize us in any way to reconcile us back to himself. He did it all by himself. He simply walked through a woman. And came down here and performed this reconciliation. Made himself a ransom for you and I. So when you talk about Jesus Christ being that mediator. This is where we see that substitute that Jesus Christ I mean, that God made for humanity through the man, Jesus Christ. He's the federal head now. He's the one that represents you and I in his, sinful, I mean, in his likeness of sinful flesh, Romans yes. 8 says. Yes, yes. In his humanity. He's the one that accomplished all of this. <clears throat> so when we look at it, we separate his humanity from his divinity. Recognizing that this is where he actually accomplished that feed at. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Mm -hmm. And we make a big deal here that the ransom is for who? Oh. This represents, now even though we see here, this represents all. When we look at the passage back in Corinthians, we see this reconciliation but we also understand that that next pass, that next verse talked about a further reconciliation. I'm going to go back just a moment mm -hmm. just to show that the contrast here. Mm -hmm. Because I really wanted to focus on the condition of the unbeliever. The condition of the unsaved. But I want to also show you how they get fully reconciled. And I'm going to, we're going to make a, deal, a big deal out of this in one moment. Look what it says here. For it says, uh, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead to what? Be ye reconciled. Be reconciled. To God. To God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Now look at this. Okay. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How can we go from him being made sin for us who knew no sin to being made the righteousness of God? What is that thing that has to take place? Amen. Believe that gospel. Amen. Do you see that this is a... It, it seems to be such a compacted verse, but there's something that has to manifest itself in order for the fullness of that verse to, to actually be uh, made come to fruition in your life or in their lives. Right. And what has to come to fruition is that they have to believe The gospel. Now, once one of these individuals believe the gospel, now, represented in red, now they become a subgroup within this whole group of reconciliation that enter into a fuller reconciliation. Uh -huh. Now, I'm going to say a fuller reconciliation now. Right now, y'all might not know why this is so important. But I guarantee you if, you, if you continue to be an ambassador for Christ, this is going to come in handy. This reconciliation of the world, what I said to you, it is temporary. Yes, sir. There's a time limit on that. Yes, sir. This reconciliation is eternal. This reconciliation allows an individual to enter in. First of all, what he does... 
he receives the righteousness of God. Yes. He's justified, sanctified, had the promise of glorification, right? Mm -hmm. He receives righteousness, and he also receives what? Eternal life. Amen. I don't know if everybody heard my brother, but he said eternal life. So see, this group of individuals, this reconciliation that we're imploring or beseeching individuals to enter into is, an inter, uh, is a reconciliation that is eternal. That's why people get confused when you get to talking about reconciliation. Because reconciliation in and of itself is to all mankind. Yes, sir. But there's a fuller aspect of reconciliation that is unique to you and I. Yes, sir. We see that? Because now when we get into the conversation of, uh, of universal salvation and universal reconciliation, this is where the confusion comes in that. They don't understand that the reconciliation of the world is not the reconciliation that the verse goes on to express. This one is necessary for, uh, so that God can save them. They were separate from God. Their sins, their trespasses that cut them off from God. In fact, we, we can go there now. Let's look at um, Ephesians um, 2 and 12. Look at our status before in, in time past. Before this takes place, we're going to look at our status back in Ephesians. And then we're going to look over there at Romans 3. This is where we really want to take a look at the, these things here. Ephesians, the second chapter. I'll look at verse 12. Look what it says. This verse is so dynamic here. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope in what? Without God in the world. Is that the status that the person has here? No. Huh? No. No. After he reconciles and does the work through Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, this changed. This is a, a, a much better place than that person in time past was that didn't have any hope and was without God outside the covenants of Israel and all of that. So we recognize that after the cross, we live in this parenthetical age, dispensation of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. D.O.G. for short. Mm -hmm. Not a bad D.O.G., but the good one. That's right. <laughs> We recognize that this dispensation of the grace of God, this parenthetical age, has changed our status before God being without hope, without God in the world. Right. We're going to get into it. We're going to put down the parentheses. We're going to show scriptural verses on what parenthesizes this age that we live in. Why it is so crucial for us to understand what has God done different that we can just simply offer a man or woman salvation by them simply trusting the fact that Christ died for their sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. It's not about what their lifestyle is like, what they're doing in their life. It's simply about what they've trusted. Yes. Have you trusted the fact that Christ did this for you? Yes. And this is the significant issue that we want to express to individuals. Let's look at Romans 3 real briefly. We just wanna, we're looking at the status of man before this work was taking place of reconciliation. Before the reconciliation took place. Look at what where man was at. Look where they were at. Look at Romans 3 verse 9. For, for time's sake, we'll just start there. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There are none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of apps are under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. Have they not known? There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith is said to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become what? Guilty, Guilty before, before God. God. That is the status that God had to place them in 
before the reconciliation took place. He had to know that you had no hope within yourself. You had to really know that you did not have an opportunity to do anything in your own strength. So Jesus Christ did it for you. Because right. see, now all the glory goes to Jesus Christ. You, There's nothing that we have to brag or boast about about anything. Everything that we that exudes from us is thanksgiving toward God because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us. Even to get us to this state of reconciliation. When you talk about intercessory prayer for others, this is primarily why you're interceding. Because God has made it very nigh unto them to believe. God has them in a great position and he allows no obstacles to get in their way. All they have to do is trust in the fact that Christ died for their sins according to scriptures. That he was buried. That he rose on the third day. They can't dig themselves deeper in the hole. Where they have to do some additional things. He always has it right there. That that's all that they have to do. In their life. Now let's put some parentheses on this. I hope you've been watching and understanding what we're talking about today. We want to put some parentheses. Because what we're saying here. Is that there's a time period. Turn back in fact. To uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 2 yep, Corinthians 6, we just read 5, right? But what we realize, but 5 and 6 is just one page. We put the numbers there so that we can separate it, but it's okay. he's going on with the same thought process. Mm-hmm. So he goes on in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 6, he says, We then as workers together with him do what? Be Why do I point that out? That's the... That's the uh, urgency, the importance. Hey Amen. When you're an ambassador, this is your manner of speak. This is not passive talk. This is not very docile information. You know, uh, right. nuclear physicist type talk. Talk <laughs> about numbers and things like that. No, this information is something that you 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 apt to show some sense of passion to it because you realize the urgency that God is putting and letting you know it's urgent by the words that He's right. saying. Right. If he's saying he's beseeching, you recognize that that is the mode, that is the manner of speech that is being used. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. See, this this leads to that urgency again. All of us in here have received the grace of God. And even individuals here have received the grace of God, whether they know it or not, right? right. But what God doesn't want the individual to do, nor I, <clears throat> nor you or I, is to receive this grace of God in vain. And the reason he doesn't want us to receive it in vain is because there is a time limit to it. It's not going to always be extended. Look what he goes on to say. For he hath said, I have heard thee in the time accepted. Wait a minute. What is this? What do you mean time accepted? Can't I just come bring this or do this anytime I want to do it? He said, I have heard you in the time except. So in other words, there's an accepted time. You ever went to go apply for a job and they say they were accepting applications between this date and this date, between this hour and this hour? Yes. And then you bring it three days later? Right. Is that going to do you any good? Because it's outside what? The time The accepted. accepted time that they would accept those applications. And when you're talking about this information that we're talking about here... There's an accepted time that God is accepting the fact that people can trust the fact that Christ died for their sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. For he saith, I have heard thee in the time accepted and in the what? Day of salvation. Day of salvation. The time accepted and the day of salvation are synonymous in this age. The day of salvation, we're going to also let you know that that is the dispensation of the grace of God. Mm -hmm. Our day of salvation in this age that we live in is the dispensation of the grace of God. Our time accepted that in the day that we live in is the dispensation of the grace of God. There's a time period to it. Look what he says. In the day of salvation, I have secured thee. Do you know what secured me? Look what it means. 
to help assist in the time of difficulty. What's our time of difficulty? Our time here on earth. Amen. See, our time of difficulty was Ephesians 2 in Romans 3. We had no hope. So God assisted us with the reconciliation and changing our status so that now we aren't without God, without hope, and can't, don't have a chance. God has given us hope through reconciliation. What hope does an individual have now? What can he do? He can now believe and be saved. Believe that Christ died for his sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. Before the reconciliation of the world, could man just believe that Christ died for their sins according to Scripture? No. no. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So now we understand. So now God has put parameters on this that it's a time element that you and I have to recognize and understand. And the reason we need to recognize it because some people look at this Bible as if the whole Bible gives them that time. Right. We have to identify where within the Scripture is this time element chart it out and where can I see it scripturally when it started and when it's going to come to an end. Do you think that might be important? Absolutely. Well, we know it already started. So whether we go back to find out where it started at is one thing. It's important for us because we don't want people to go beyond its starting point and try to grab something from there. And when it ends, we want to definitely be sure of because at the end time, we want to make sure that people aren't trying to use a salvation that doesn't apply to them in ages to come. And we don't want them to try to use this salvation once it's over. That's right. Because once it's over, it's over. That's right. So let's try to figure this out. Now, look at 1 uh, Timothy 1.16. 1 Timothy 1.16. Now, when I like to use this verse, now you can get a lot of, you can get a few verses. There's about three verses that you can encapsulate this with, so to speak. You can use the gospel. You can actually use 1 Corinthians 15, 1, uh, 3 through 4 for this as well. But I like to say it like this because I really want to show them scripturally where this even started at. Now, look at 1 Timothy 1, 16. Look what it says here. This is who's speaking? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. Why is Apostle Paul so important? He holds the gospel for others. Apostle of the Gentiles. Yes, amen. He holds, he holds the, that information. So look what he's saying. He says, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first. You get that? Mm -hmm. Is anybody so, as it pertains to what we're talking about, I'll finish reading, then I'll come back. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter do what? Believe on him. Believe on him to what? Life Bless everlasting. Him. Have you and I believed on him to life everlasting? Yes. Right. So now he's letting us know that he was the first one. Anybody after him falls into our category. But he was the first one as it pertains to what God is doing in this particular dispensation. Yes. So we'll put, I'll put that verse there. That's 1 Timothy 1.16. Yes. And then I want to, if it stops there, that's the beginning of how God reconciled the world and individuals can be saved by simply believing 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, mm -hmm. the fact that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures, if this is the beginning, and this is so important for, uh, for us to tell the world, we also want to know not only when it began, but when is it the time that is accepted going to be over right, right. for people to believe that gospel and be saved. Right. Because there's going to come a time that that's going to no longer be sufficient. And that's why their reconciliation is not permanent. Now we're going to get into some things. This reconciliation is only good as long as they're living on earth, or what happens? The gathering, the rapture, the body of Christ. Somebody else, maybe I didn't hear him. What did he say? The rapture. You have, you have to understand this. Now look why that's so significant. While they have breath in their body, God allows them, during the dispensation of the grace of God, if Christ doesn't come back first, 
God gives them the opportunity to simply believe that Christ died for their sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day according to Scripture. And they enter in from this temporary portion of reconciliation, which really gives Jesus Christ the opportunity to judge the living and the dead here. This is, he's done, re, he, by his ransom, he repurchased them. He has the right to be called Lord of all now right. because of what was accomplished. It's a lot happens here, hmm. but we're dealing with reconciliation. Hmm. Once that person believes the gospel, he enters into an eternal reconciliation that doesn't end. So we see that. So now when we look at that, we look at it from the vantage point of exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. So now, when would this age end? Turn over here to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. I mean, yeah, 4.13. Four Thessalonians 4.13 because we want to put a time everything we see that the Bible is actually a timeline mm -hmm. and if you're not reading it from the vantage point of seeing what God did in time past what he's doing but now what he's going to do ages to come you're not understanding this Bible if you're just picking choosing anecdotes and trying to think put things together I remember my uncle used to say that uh, if you want a word from God all you got to do is turn your Bible like this For now should I have lain still and been quiet, should I have slept and then had been rest. That's in Job. Now you you make that make sense that day and you live by it. I hear you. Really, I mean that's really what we used to do. I mean not we used to do, but I remember him used to tell him like, okay. Yeah. Like it's a magic book. Like it's a fortune cookie. Whatever you talk and touch to that that's what how you live your life that day. Is that how we deal with God's word? No, sir. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We rightly divide the word of truth. So 1 Thessalonians shows us the end of when this is going to be acceptable. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 Yes. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Mm -hmm. For the Lord shall, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Mm -hmm. Once that event happens, in 1 Thessalonians, what? Chapter 4. And what? Verses 13 through 18. Once that happens, this period of time, the dispensation of grace of God, the accepted time, the day of salvation, all of this is going to be done. These individuals that had that moment, they had the hope, the opportunity to be saved by simply believing that gospel. Once that happens, they stand up not before God at the Bema seat, but they now have to be resigned to the great white throne of judgment. Because the works of Christ are no longer going to be able to be held toward their account. Right. Guess whose works God is going to look at for their righteousness? Theirs. Their own works. And guess what? Their works their won't, won't match up. You understand what we're saying here? So this is why it's so significant in the dispensation of the grace of God that we continue to understand these things. So now this leads to a few questions. Because the last time I actually spoke on this particular topic, it left some questions that I'm just now getting. I'm just now getting um, some questions that were left by different individuals. The, the, the topic of the study before was... Um, Universal reconciliation is not universal salvation. So I had some um, individuals from the universal salvation group mm -hmm. um, submit some questions to me. And listen, I'm telling you, a servant of the Lord must not strive, right? Yes, sir. We're not, we're not at odds against anybody. We're, we're, we're looking at individuals by which we're trying to get them to see the truth. That's right. Because if they can see the truth, they can be taken out of the snare. That's right. 
and possibly begin to use sound doctrine in their lives and benefit others that are around them as well. So some questions become, begin to pop up. And I think they're worth actually noting, and we're going to talk about them for a moment here as we begin to um, wind it down today. First of all, I want to ask you about this. How many of you know about this unpardonable, unforgivable sin um, question that's out there? You ever heard that? Is there an unpardonable, unforgivable sin? Yeah. Now, this is almost in traditional Christianity, right? But in traditional Christianity, if they say it was an unpardonable, unforgivable sin, what sin was that? Denying Christ. What was it? Denying Christ. Denying Christ. Amen. They say denying Christ. What else they say? Denying the Holy Ghost. Remember that? So now that was it. If you deny Christ, you deny the Holy Ghost. That's unforgivable. God can't forgive you for that, right? We now understand that every sin is paid for in this dispensation. There's no sin. That's going to keep you from accessing God. No sin. See, as it's termed to be sin. Because Christ did what? Died he you. died for died. sins. So don't try to make it a sin to put it in somebody's way of not getting the salvation of God today. Okay? So we say that simply to try to phrase another question. Someone used that same understanding and they wanted to ask this question. Are there people, are people in hell with their sins forgiven? Are people in hell with their sins forgiven? First of all, whenever you hear a question, you have to absorb the question based upon sound doctrine and evaluate the question to see if it's actually a pertinent question. Is it a question that can even be phased, uh, phrased that way? You see that? They're saying, are there people in hell with their sins forgiven? The major word there that you first and foremost look at is forgiven. That's right. Amen? So we look at forgiven. Every time you look, and, and then we have to recognize that we're only answering this question in light of the dispensation or the acceptable time that we're living in, right? We can't go back to time past. We can't go ahead to ages to come, but we're always evaluating everything we say in the dispensation of the grace of God in which we live. That's encapsulized in these verses, right? So once we understand that, we look at the question and we begin to understand it. What, when we see forgiveness... Who is it expressed to? Turn to Romans 4, 5 through 7. That's a great question. Romans 4. Because this is a question. I, it's, we may, Y'all may have never heard it, but it's buzzing out there. That's a great question. It's buzzing. Because, see, this is, the, this is a question that is meant to take you somewhere else to try to defeat the truth. But I'm going to show you exactly how it lines up. When you're talking about forgiveness... Look at um, Romans 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. What? <laughs> so now we know we're talking about a believer, right? True indeed. Let's go a little further. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are what? Forgiven. Forgiven. And whose sins are covered. So now, in this particular verse, in the context that is used, is this forgiveness that we see expressed to a person that is not a believer, or is it expressed to one that is a believer? In this verse that we're reading, I believe. did this person believe the gospel, or is this person somebody who hasn't believed the gospel yet? Believe. 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 Okay, that's three. Three is enough. Okay, so we express that. That we see in this verse, at least in this verse, right. that forgiveness is expressed to a believer. Right. We have, we know that all people's God has paid for all sin. Right. But the term forgiveness is only expressed to those that have accepted Beautiful. what God has done for them. So Beautiful. let's go and see if that pans out. Because you have to be line upon line, precept mm -hmm. upon precept. We don't want to use one verse. We want to use a collaboration of verses to establish that truth. Ephesians 1. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1, 7. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of son, sins, according to the riches of his grace. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you may have read ahead already, but this is the passage, this area of scripture is showing us that we're chosen by God the Father, redeemed by God the Son, sealed by the, God the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. So, just based upon what you know about this verse, is this forgiveness being expressed about somebody who has not believed, or is this forgiveness talking towards someone who has already believed the gospel? Someone who has believed the gospel. Believer, okay? Mm -hmm. So we see that every time we see that term forgiveness, it's always being expressed to somebody who has believed. Let's turn to Ephesians 4.32. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4.32. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, said what? Forgiving you. Who is this being expressed to? A non-believer or a believer? Believer. This is the believer as well. So now we look through the scripture. We're going to get one more just to, just to kind of like polish this up. Mm -hmm. And make sure that we're saying the right thing because this is going to go to something else. Colossians 2.13. Don't get out of here. Hold on one second here. Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, had he quickened together with him, having did what? Forgiving you all trespasses. Is this person a believer or a non believer? Believer. How, what's evidence in there that says he's a believer? Quickened together. Have, that's right. Have, so we see that this is a believer. Every time you see the term forgiven in the dispensation of grace, it's only applied to those that have believed. Absolutely. So we know for a fact, these individuals, although their sins have been paid for, God never referred to their sins as being forgiven. Right. I said that they were forgiven the last time I preached this message. Okay. Oversight on my behalf. Okay. That's the correction I want to make. But it's important that you understand that because now I want to rephrase the question. Because this is it. If you say, see... This is what they want to say. And, and this is the next thing. These people, would you say that what they're doing is the sin of unbelief? These people that haven't believed? Can you say now, based upon what we know, these individuals that simply need to get over here by believing the gospel, is what they're doing the sin of unbelief? The sin of unbelief. That's what's keeping them from receiving the salvation of God. Is the sin of unbelief. Can we say. Is it, is it sound doctrine to say. That these individuals who have been reconciled to God. Because of what he's done. And pay for their sins. The only thing keeping them from the eternity with God, being made righteous and receiving eternal life, is the sin of unbelief. No. Why not? Because he died for all sin. Amen. You see, that's why it has to be very careful. See, if we call this a sin, now you have to say, well, if it's a sin, guess what? It ain't paid for. It's either it's not paid for or it is paid for. See, this is a part of what somebody told me. If it's paid for, that means that this sin can't keep them out of this. You see? This is why when God doesn't say that that's what it is, you can't just allow people to lead you in conversation based upon terminology that they done pulled up from somewhere. If the word of God says it's not the sin of unbelief, we don't say it's the sin of unbelief. We know that it's what's keeping them out of eternity, but it's not called the sin. Let's look at unbelief very briefly here. Titus 1.15. Be over just a little bit. I remember last time I was over a little bit this way. I believe this is important. Titus 1.15. It's the only place you see unbelieving here. Look what it says. Unto the pure all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. I mean, nothing is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is what? Defile, right? They profess that they know God, but in their works they deny him being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. Okay? 
So when we see unbelieving, we already see them characterized in Pauline epistles. But see what happens is, when an individual here doesn't accept the salvation that's provided here, God reserves them for a judgment. You realize that? They don't have a separate judgment that's exclusive to the dispensation of the grace of God. Where are these people be judged if they don't believe the fact that Christ died for this sins according to the scriptures was buried and rose on the third day? Great right throne to judge. So let's go there. Revelations 20. Revelations 20, 11 through 15. Revelations 20, 11 through 15. Look what it says here. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now look what it goes and say. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their what? Works. You see that? You see how cleverly, and over there in Titus, it talks about their works. And now you see, because this individual here is still going to be relying on his works. He has not submitted himself to the righteousness of God by believing in Christ. But look what it goes on to say. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever name was, uh, whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into what? The lake of fire. The lake of fire. So we see this very clearly that this is exactly what will manifest itself with these individuals. So now I just want to, for, for, for uh, uh, Revelation 21 and 8. Okay. Revelation 21 and 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in what? Lake of fire which burneth, uh, lake of fire uh, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is what? The second, the second death. death. So these individuals, if they don't believe this gospel during the dispensation of grace, this is what is going to be their demise. This is what's going to be their end mm -hmm. when you see that. But now I want to answer the question based upon how the question should have been phrased. If they See, if they that question was phrased in a way to pull you back to say that that sin wasn't paid for. So if the sin is paid for, the sin of unbelief is paid for, that means everybody is saved. That's what universal, that's mm -hmm. one of the, one of the mm -hmm. branches of universal uh, salvation. Mm -hmm. That's one of the arguments that was brought to me, but I kept going back to say... No, the sin, there's no sin of unbelief. Where are you getting a sin of unbelief? Because if you phrase it sin, when the Bible doesn't phrase it sin, you try to place it to something else. Right. But this is, the, this is the question that should have been posed. Are there people in hell with their sins paid for? Where are their sins paid for? The cross, the man, Christ Jesus. Where are their sins paid for? Amen. Amen. Time accepted. This is the son of grace of God. This is the time when an individual can utilize the payment that Christ made for them. You remember we're talking about you go, if you go during that certain time, it would be sufficient. But if you go after that time, that payment, you God's not going to accept that application or that payment. That's right. What ends that time for them that they can actually utilize what Christ did on their behalf? Two things. Their death and the rapture. So, when you're talking about it, anybody in hell with their sins paid for, they're not in hell. They're not in hell with their sins paid for. Their sin issue was taken care of during the time, during this particular age, during this dispensation of the grace of God. But when they stand up before God, their sins aren't paid for. They're paying for it. They're going to have to try to do their own thing. And guess what? It's not going to match up. That's why the urgency. That's why we beseech. Now is a great opportunity for you to be absolved of all your sin. You've been made free from sin. Sin is no longer the issue. Well, I'm not going to say made free from sin. Because actually a person is dead in trespasses and sin. 
But God is gracious enough not to impute them trespasses unto them. And they simply can believe unto salvation today. And that's what we beseech and implore individuals in the dispensation of grace. Trust what God has provided through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Any questions or comments?